Welcome back to Hardware Unboxed. It was roughly a year ago from today that AMD re-entered the CPU market in a serious way with Ryzen, and it took the enthusiast market by storm. These new high-performance chips were so enticing for productivity workloads that I decided to do a full system upgrade and move across to Ryzen for my main system, which I use for video editing and a bit of gaming. You might remember the build video I did for this system back in March of 2017. If not, you can check it out around here. So I've been using Ryzen full time for basically a year now and before second gen Ryzen lands next month, I wanted to do a recap of a year with Ryzen and give my thoughts on being an early adopter of the platform. So first, let's do a quick refresher on the Ryzen lineup as it launched throughout 2017. I'm going to ignore the new APUs as they've only just launched, instead focusing on the pure CPU launches of 2017. So first up we got the 8 core 16 thread Ryzen 7 line in early March which offered twice the cores of Intel's then quad core KB Lake series and subsequently impressed with its productivity performance at its very similar price points. Considering all Ryzen CPUs are unlocked and overclockable, the best option here was the $329 Ryzen 7 1700 which was very easy to overclock up to around 4 GHz. The Ryzen 7 1700X and 1800X weren't as good value, but that's only because they were overshadowed by the 1700. In April, we got the Ryzen 5 line, which consisted of the 6 core 12 thread Ryzen 5 1600 and 1600X, along with the 4 core 8 thread Ryzen 5 1500X and 1400. Again, due to the unlocked nature of all Ryzen CPUs, the 1600 and 1400 made the most sense depending on how many cores you needed. And at $170 for the 1400 and $220 for the 1600, these were really good value for pretty much everyone. And later in June, we got the Ryzen 3 line with four cores and four threads consisting of the Ryzen 3 1200 and Ryzen 3 1300X. Again, a bit of a theme here, but the Ryzen 3 1200 was a great buy at $110 and could be overclocked strongly. From a value and performance perspective, there were great buys across the Ryzen 3, Ryzen 5 and Ryzen 7 lines and plenty of reason to choose AMD over Intel's disappointing KB Lake processors. This did change a bit when Intel launched 6-core Coffee Lake CPUs towards the end of 2017. The in-demand Core i5-8400 was a particularly great option, but AMD still managed to hold their own against the newer Intel options. And this kind of brings me to my first point about being a Ryzen early adopter. Whenever you make a purchase like this, there is always the question of whether you should have just waited for the next big thing, in this case Intel's Coffee Lake line, which was only six to seven months away. Of course, with any tech purchase, you could have just waited for something better, but in the case of Coffee Lake, while Intel's new processors were pretty damn good, they didn't make me regret my Ryzen purchase at all. And this is because of one simple thing. Ryzen is still very competitive and a great all-round CPU, particularly the Ryzen 7 1700 and Ryzen 5 1600. Coffee Lake by no means blew AMD out of the water, which is something we haven't been able to say about the Intel-AMD rivalry for a long time. Had Intel come out and offered orders of magnitude more performance than my Ryzen 7 system, I might have felt a bit of buyer's remorse, but that didn't really happen, and ended up still satisfied with Ryzen after watching all of Steve's benchmark videos. And of course, I'd already enjoyed six months of excellent performance before Intel rejoined the party. And I'm really happy choosing AMD's platform for another key reason. With Ryzen 2 just around the corner, I can think about upgrading to a faster CPU without needing to replace my motherboard. AMD has kept their promise that all AM4 motherboards will be compatible with future generation of CPUs, potentially up to 2020. So it's just a simple matter of a CPU swap if or when it's worth it to do so. Had I stuck with Intel, I'd have needed to replace my motherboard to upgrade to Coffee Lake and I'd no doubt need to do so again for the next generation. The system I ended up using was slightly different to the one in the build video, a bit of production and other reasons that went into that, but the build video showed me using a Ryzen 7 17 on a Gigabyte AB350 Gaming 3 motherboard, but shortly after we filmed the video, we swapped that out for a Ryzen 7 1700X and an ASUS ROG Crosshair 6 Hero X370 motherboard. We did need to use the 1700 and B350 motherboard for a few other projects, so we made this minor change to some other stuff we had lying around. This is where the first issue I had with Ryzen comes in, and this is purely down to being a very early adopter. 
We all heard about Ryzen memory issues at launch, with some CPUs and motherboards doing a rather poor job of supporting the DDR4 options on the market at the time, you know, save for some Ryzen approved kits. Well, I got stuck with what I thought was this problem with my Ryzen system after swapping to the Crosshair 6 motherboard. We used 32 gig of Corsair DDR4 3000 memory with the original build and it worked fine, but after swapping to the Crosshair 6, I could only get the system working with two of the four 8 gig modules in stores and only at 2666 speeds rather than the 2933 that should have easily worked. I thought this was down to the memory issues we'd heard about and I did decide to wait for a few BIOS and system updates to see if they would resolve the issue. And these fixes did allow me to push up the memory speeds to 2933 but I still couldn't get the full 32 gig working so obviously uh, alarms going off there but as it turns out the Crosshair 6 Hero motherboard provided to us by AMD and this was the original motherboard provided to us alongside Ryzen 7 for our initial review that had two faulty dim slots. It wasn't a memory compatibility or BIOS issue at all but rather a problem with the first batch of motherboards. I subsequently swapped back to the Gigabyte AB350 Gaming 3 and I haven't had a problem since. And this is one of the problems with being an early adopter in the first few months of Ryzen. It did take a couple of months for BIOS and AMD platform updates to sort out the memory compatibility issues and the very first run of motherboards also had a couple of issues. Motherboard manufacturers didn't have much time to get out products for the Ryzen 7 launch and of course we were looking at an entirely new platform so there were going to be a few issues around that sort of launch. Unfortunately early adopters had to bear the brunt of these issues and that really should have been fixed pre-launch but since those issues in the early days I've had basically no problems with the platform. As for overclocking, I've been comfortably running at 3.9 GHz on my Ryzen 7 1700X since launch. My CPU can't quite hit 4 GHz at sensible voltages, but I hear most 1700Xs and 1700s can. I'm still quite satisfied with 3.9 GHz anyway. And I could achieve this overclock on both the X370 Crosshair 6 Hero and the B350 GB AB350 Gaming 3, which is nice considering the B350 board is a hell of a lot cheaper. It's $90 rather than $250 for the ASUS X370 option. So provided you don't choose a board with terrible VRMs or VRM cooling, it sounds like a lot of B350 boards are great for overclocking even the top-end Ryzen 7 CPUs and that's certainly been my experience. Another concern that arose around launch was Ryzen's single thread performance, which is behind Intel and not exactly helped by Ryzen's inability to clock higher than around 4.2 GHz in the best case situations. Admittedly, I did think this may be somewhat of an issue when I upgraded to Ryzen, but after a year using the CPU every day, it's just not a big deal at all. Most of the tasks I do for work, which involve video editing and rendering in Premiere, basic web browsing, document creation and Excel spreadsheet work, they're either all fully multi-threaded and make use of Ryzen 7's 8 cores, or happen fast enough that additional single-threaded performance would make a negligible difference. In fact, the main task I perform on my PC that involves a lot of waiting for things to complete is video rendering, which is fully multi-threaded and completes faster than an equivalently priced Intel system. There just aren't that many day-to-day single-threaded workloads I use, which makes Ryzen's slightly inferior single-threaded performance pretty much a non-issue. You definitely couldn't say this a few years back when multi-threaded was you know, a less common thing, but these days single-threaded tasks are truly on their way out. Now of course if Ryzen was significantly behind Intel in single-threaded performance like they used to be with Bulldozer, it definitely would be an issue and would harm multi-threaded tasks in the process, but Ryzen gets close enough for me and it's going to be similar for most other buyers out there. Plus I'm really enjoying having 8 cores, it's awesome for multitasking. The other big story at the launch of Ryzen was gaming performance. When testing CPU limited gaming at 720p or 1080p, Ryzen 7 was often a fair way behind Intel's Kaby Lake in popular titles and this caused a lot of concern among buyers, definitely a lot of discussion on our videos. Ryzen was a great value proposition for productivity, but gaming performance was disappointing and not that attractive to those building a pure gaming system. In 2018, this is still somewhat the case. The Core i7-8700K, for example, still holds a pretty solid lead over the Ryzen 7 1800X in most games, despite the 1800X outperforming the 8700K in the number of multi-threaded productivity tests. However, the gap between AMD and Intel in-games has closed a little bit since launch, 
what used to be a significant gap at 1080p with something you know like a GTX 1080 Ti has shrunk a bit. There's still a gap that gives the 8700K a lead, but it's not the surprisingly large discrepancy it once was. And this is down to a few things. Games are becoming more multi-threaded, so titles released since the launch of Ryzen are more likely to support Ryzen's capabilities properly and more likely to use more threads. Again, Intel does still hold a lead with a lot of modern games, but we are seeing a trend of the gap narrowing. And while very few older games received updates to help rise in performance, more general updates to the platform drivers, BIOS and Windows and so forth, have assisted gaming performance to a small degree. It's not a game changer, but it has helped the situation since launch. And to be honest, the whole situation of Intel leading in gaming performance only applies to a subsection of the gaming population. Those that game at 1080p or lower with a high-end GPU like a GTX 1080 Ti. If you are GPU limited, either through using a lower end GPU or gaming at a higher resolution, there is very little difference in performance between Coffee Lake and Ryzen, at least for gaming in 2018. In the future, it might be a little different as games become more CPU limited, but right now, you need to have a specific hardware setup to benefit from Intel's gaming performance lead. And that's sort of where my experiences with Ryzen for gaming come in. I have a Titan X Pascal, but I game at 3440 by 1440, so in basically every game I'm GPU limited. With this sort of setup, Ryzen has been fantastic for gaming. I've had no issues, and in general, I'm not missing out on any extra performance I'd otherwise have from a Coffee Lake system. So even though I was a bit concerned when I first saw Ryzen's gaming benchmarks, in actual practice with my setup, I've had no issues. So overall, I've been really happy with my Ryzen system. It's been a great choice for video editing and day-to-day -day work, and it's been very capable for high-end gaming. Aside from a few early adopter teething issues in the first few months, it's been smooth sailing since then. I'm looking forward to seeing what second-gen Ryzen brings next month. I think a lot of the early adopter problems with the Ryzen platform have been largely resolved, and I'll have no trouble recommending Ryzen to buyers right now, especially as it, you know, it continues to be good value for money for productivity and gaming workloads compared to Intel's offerings. Though I guess at this point you should probably wait for Ryzen 2 to see what that's like. Anyway, that's it for this recap of Ryzen after 12 months. If you've been using Ryzen 2, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below about how it's been going for you. Don't forget to smash the like button and I'll catch you in the next one.